Praise be Jesus and Mary. This gospel here today is a, a beautiful way to reflect on our relationship with our Lord, how we need to stay close to him, recognizing, you know, when one of the signs of that closeness, of course, is that we are striving to be in his grace, particularly sanctifying grace, as we never completely sure of that, but if we're not conscious of mortal sin, then we tend to presume that we're in his grace. And what coupled with that is, of course, charity. Because whenever we lose sanctifying grace, commit a mortal sin, we also lose the virtue of charity, true charity. This true charity is actually a union with God. If, we don't, if we're not in union with God, then we really can't draw other souls. We can't draw ourselves. We can't be united with our Lord, except we repent. In fact, that's uh, when they talk about, uh, the saints talk about, uh, you know, striving for the greater glory of God, as St. Ignatius of Loyola liked to say, or as St. Maximilian Colby liked to put it, striving for the greatest glory of God. St. Ignatius would have said, amen, that's exactly what I mean. <laughs> But uh, this is a striving, really, of drawing other souls, including my own. This is one of the things we learn also from St. Paul, that we must strive to be united with Christ first and above all. Christ doesn't ask us to separate ourselves from him to save another soul, you know, to draw another soul to Christ. God desires us to save ourselves and others, not others excluding ourselves. That would not be God's will. He wants all to be saved, including ourselves. And I can't work for the salvation of others if I'm not striving to save my own soul, to rectify myself with God, to be in his presence, to let him dwell within me. And yet we can't do this if we don't pray. To learn what God is asking of me, to learn well, to work really on my relationship with God. You know, the beautiful, the way the saints tell us, you know, this prayer and meditation is an intimate relationship, is a dialogue with God. And how am I to know what God wants of me if I don't spend time with him, don't spend time learning what he wants? And we learn, you know, God makes use of various different modes. Aside from well, at first it may be our parents. <clears throat> other times you know, it, can, it can be other people in authority that reveal God's will to me or hint at it. When I say hint at that, well, we can take go step back for a moment. You know, say children have a right to, to choose their state in life. Well, the parents, it's not wrong for the parents to hint, to try and give some of their preferences, perhaps what they think might be best for the child, but they have to bear in mind that these are only recommendations. They're not, they can't say lay down the law uh, and try to unduly, unjustly influence or force, as it were, their child to make a decision which the child isn't drawn to. And sometimes, well, it's funny too, but sometimes a child is drawn to something, but they know, they, they know what God's wanting of them, but they don't want to do it, and so they... <laughs> they do what we all do. Same thing when we know God wants something of us and we don't want to do it. We get, we get, upset, we get a little uptight. I'm thinking of an example of St. Uh, John Vianney, a little, a little girl. St. John Vianney could, of course, read hearts. At any rate, this one little girl, um, he, he told her she had a vocation. She stamped her foot as little girls are wont to do, and she said, no, no, no. <laughs> he stamped his foot right back and said, yes, yes, yes. <laughs> But this doesn't happen if we don't take time to be close to the Lord. And to discern, I mean, God, God will draw us, you know, in accordance with where we're at. You know, one of the signs of a vocation early in life may be the simple fact that, well, you think something's cool about something, you know, it could be in, in, in the workforce, you know, something really takes the child's fancy, you know, some kids, I want to be a cop, some, you know, the firefighter, they just think this is a great thing. Others, religious or priest, 
something will draw them. You know, God will use a natural means, their own inclinations, as it were, to give them a hint of where he's trying to draw them. He's put the desire in their heart. What they have to discern is if, it's, if they're motivated by a type of selfishness. And that has to be at least rooted out, even, even if it, <clears throat> say, the first child's desire. I mean, this sometimes is even how, say, relationships start. They start in what we like to call poppy love. I won't explain any further, but we all, <laughs> those of us who know what we're talking about, they know what I mean. It's, a, it's immature. And if, if a relationship doesn't go beyond the puppy love, it'll die. Because it's not real. It's not what a relationship is built on. It's some love goes deeper. Because it gets it to the person. It loves the person. Their whole being. You know, she's pretty, he's handsome or whatever. Well, she's going to become, you know, old, wrinkly and fat. And he's going to be cold, old, bald-headed and dumpy. <laughs> if, rela- if the relationship doesn't go a little bit deeper than that, I mean, what is it that we watch these, you know, elderly couples, 50 years, 60 years, 70 years, even 20 years. What keeps them together is real love. And this is what you, we also, you'll witness it, you know, it's, you know especially among Catholics, but I won't say it's, uh, I wouldn't say it's exclusively Catholic if there's, if there's a real love of, of one another. But real love there even means, as God tells us, how do we know that we say love our spouse or love our children as we're supposed to, love our friends as we're supposed to? If selfishness is a part of it, then you don't love them. Because I have to love God first. If I'm united to God, then I can really, truly love my friends, my spouse, my children, really everything properly because I love them in God not disassociated with God. This is, and it does take some discernment. It takes prayer to realize, where is this going? Sometimes if we're sensitive to our relationship with God, we can realize that a friendship is going bad. Maybe if we catch it soon enough, we can save it. Unhealthy friendships often end up in, in great sorrow and much hurt. Sometimes they can, they can even end in, in outright hatred. But even that, you know, if it does break up and I reconcile myself with God, while, say, the, the friendship may never, ever go back to any kind of what we want to call, put it friendship in quotes, because it's not a real friendship, there may never be any kind of real relationship at all with, a, say, a lost friend, because a, a, the relationship went bad, things went awry. But if I reunite myself, reconnect myself with God, then that relationship can be restored in one sense in that now I am praying for this individual that they they come to God. Maybe I'm doing penances so that this person, even if we have to say stay away from one another or whatever because we get under one another's skin or whatever the problem may be that's made the relationship go bad, uh, friendship go bad, doesn't mean that I can't pray for their soul and desire them to be united to God. And in that sense one part of that relationship has been restored and been made proper the way it ought to have been from the start. And this is, you know, it can be true even for the, well, our possessions and everything. Sometimes, you know, while certainly a good sign that you're attached to, a, attached to something is if it's broken or destroyed or stolen and you're unduly upset about it. That's a sign that maybe you're attached to it. And maybe if it was stolen, maybe God allowed it to be stolen to show you, let you know how attached you were to that item. And so this is, you know, these, this little discernment, the humility to realize, especially if we overreact on things, I and mean, certainly we might feel a loss, especially if it's something, you know, a person has their house stolen. I mean, that's kind of, that's a huge thing. Um, but we shouldn't let it be so we shouldn't be so attached to it as it were to want to lose our souls over it that's when we know there's something wrong 
and we know that we're really attached, whatever the item is, whatever the relationship is, if it becomes so dear to me that I'm willing to jeopardize my soul over it, then something's wrong. And yet, okay, that's the bad part. And we've talked about all the, all the dead branches that are going to get burned. But even in our healthy relationships, this is, if I'm praying, you know, healthy relationships, you know, my possess, say all my desires are in accordance with, say, my things of, that I possess and own or whatever like that, God sometimes still allows these things to be taken away. In one sense, it can be a sacrifice to make sure that I really am detached. Maybe, I'm, maybe there's a little attachment growing, so there's some pruning that's happening so that I maintain a healthy relationship with the Lord. And this communicates itself really to other people. People begin to see this in our life. This is part of our witness in our life. That preference for God above all and everything else. Nothing, let nothing separate us from the love of God. That that fire of God, that love of of God, that fire for his divine love, ardent desire, never leave us. As we contemplate Our Lady, she who made her yes, knowing what her son was to suffer, not attached to the promise made, knowing that God would fulfill it, and what faith she had to watch everything apparently destroyed this is, the, this is the, our Lord was the son of the promise. He will sit and reign upon the throne of David and his kingdom will never end. And she'd see him die on the cross. And yet she believed, she trusted in what the Lord had told her, never wavering, but with courage stood at the foot of the cross of Calvary. And what seemed a total and utter defeat was in reality our victory and hers. For her son truly does reign forever. And we will all realize this one day. Hopefully we'll be on the right side, um, rejoicing forever with our Lord and our Blessed Mother. Let us strive to have that love and ask Our Lady to have that love of our Lord that she does. And to love one another as our Lord and Our Lady has loved us, sacrificing themselves for us so that we might be happy with them in heaven. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.